Hi, I'm Ashley Ralph. I'm a owner, co-owner at Prime Bees Apiary and Bryan College Station. I'm also president of the Texas Beekeepers Association. And today, this talk is going to go over annual management, how you can be a better beekeeper through understanding how bees act in each time of the year, and also what's going on inside these hives and how you might deal with that um, depending on the season. So let's just go ahead and dive right in. The first thing that I like to talk about is that we really want to think like a bee. So what this means is the more you can understand about the motivations behind why bees do what they do, the way that they act and react to things going on in both their hive and outside their hive is going to help you to be a better beekeeper. So I would strongly encourage you to dig into bee biology, dig into understanding kind of the social structure of these hives. Um, and then that way you'll be able to, to kind of follow um, continue to, to make smart decisions for your own apiary. So the first thing I'm gonna do is kind of break down each of the major seasons. So we're gonna talk about early spring and when we talk about early spring, I don't wanna break this down January, February, March, April, May, June, July. I don't wanna go through each month because there's not a calendar date on a lot of this stuff. Um, and, and besides that, you know, what my experience is here in Brazos County may be a little bit different in another county in Texas, but generally speaking, we're all going through the exact same stuff. Um, and so I'm gonna characterize the seasons just by characterizing the seasons rather than naming them by months. So early spring to us means it's, it's pretty cold. Um, there are some trees kind of starting to bloom. This is essentially kind of the first activity of the year. Um, the days start to get a little bit longer after that, you know, winter solstice. And, and so you can kind of see the beekeeping season on the horizon. Um, the reason this is important is when we start talking about bees, we want to be 30, 60, 90 days ahead of them as far as where we're thinking about in the seasons. So, you know, early spring, knowing that spring is right around the corner, you really want to prepare that equipment make sure that you're ready for anything that's going to come at you during the spring. So if you're working on your very first hive, you probably still want to go ahead and have some spare boxes, spare equipment ready and available to you when you need it. The next thing, um, if you've already got a hive in hand and you're managing it currently, you want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on them. This early spring before flowers really start to blossom and bloom can be a dangerous time for bees to run out of food. The temperatures start heating up just a little bit, they're eating a little bit more, they're starting to go into brood production mode, and so they're consuming more of the food that is inside their hive. And so you really wanna make sure that you're checking and watching those bees throughout um, throughout this time frame, so you can do that a couple of different ways. You can walk up to the to the side of the hive if it's a Langstroth hive. You can kind of tip it from the corner. If it's a top bar hive, you may want to be looking inside if you've got a window, or um, you know you can still do a little bit of um, maneuvering and lifting um, with top bar as well. Basically, what you're looking for is some weight. Um, bees don't weigh much, so you could have a larger population of bees in there, but if there's not resources like nectar, pollen, um, honey, that kind of stuff, you are going to have, um, you are going to have a pretty light hive. And so you want to be watching for that. If they're light, you can get in there and give them some feed. Just wait till the afternoon, wait till temperatures are over 55. Um, and then Dire emergencies, you know, sometimes you just have to, to get in there and feed them, even if it's, you know, 54 degrees. So make smart decisions here, but essentially you're looking for them to potentially be running out of resources. If those resources are dwindling, you can simply give them either some, um, either some solid, um, like sugar, um, 
course I can't think of what is the stuff that people put on cakes. It's an icing. Um, anyway, <laughs> give them a solid sugar uh, kind of substance, or you can give them a really thick um, water and sugar mixture or syrup of some kind. Um, you just want to be careful that if you put moisture, real liquidy feed into the hive, that you're not doing that at a time when you're about to hit a cold snap or something that could cause the bees to freeze. Putting that extra moisture in the hive does make them a little more susceptible to that. Next, we'll kind of leap into springtime. Springtime is the best part of bees season, in my opinion. There's a lot of flowers blooming. Um, a lot of these hives, you can start to split them. Um, you can, you can, I love working our nukes in, in the springtime. Essentially, this is just a fun time of the year. The weather is still super pleasant. Um, it's, it's warm, obviously, because we're, you know, here in Texas, but at the same time, you've got a lot going on. The bees are bringing in pollen, they're bringing in nectar, um, and they're starting to kind of build up. Springtime is increase mode for bees, meaning they're starting to multiply in large numbers. You could open a hive one day and then three weeks later, it looks completely different. So you really need to be keeping an eye on space. You can go ahead and remove those entrance reducers that you had in the, in the winter time to give them um, you know, more freedom to come and go. And then you can be, you can be monitoring them for wanting, if, if you wanna split your hives, now's a great time to do it. If you think you're gonna split your hives, doing it in the springtime is a good time because it's a harder to mess up. So if you're doing your very first splits, springtime is a really good time to get in there and play with that. Um, essentially, you just wanna make sure that they've got enough bees, they've got enough resources to kind of get them started. Um, but with, with, the, with the abundance of resources outside of their hive, it's much easier for a new or a, or a young smaller split to get started in the spring than it will be in the fall. So this is a good time to play around with your bees and, and kind of get to know, you know what works and what doesn't. You will make mistakes and that is totally fine. Um, so full hive inspections in the springtime, you know, you don't have to do that every time you go into your yard, but you do want to be looking at your bees, you know, pulling the top off, checking them out um, fairly frequently as you're getting used to how quickly they're building up, you know, do they need more space, adding boxes, you know, putting the um, follower board out a little further, just making sure that your hive has more space. And so that is, I mean, that's springtime. This is, this is the time where you're gonna be looking for queen cells and you know, monitoring how your bees are reacting um, as far as the space that they're given. So have fun with springtime because it's not always, I mean, it's not always as good as spring. So going into summer, we're gonna characterize that by, it's, it's pretty hot. Um, you know, as we get towards the end of the summer, you do have the heat so high that flowers are no longer blooming. And that's where you really have to be careful again for the second time that bees can um, end, up, end up having no resources to go and gather and can actually starve. So it, it, it's not something people think about very often because you think, oh, okay, we have lots of bees in here, they're doing great. Well, a lot of bees with little food can be a really big problem. And so you need to keep an eye on resources and make sure that your bees have what they need. Summertime is also when we're typically extracting our spring honey. So kind of um, everyone, has a little bit different schedules, but um, you know we we let that we let the bees go ahead and produce, and then right before um, right before we end up with any dearth or situations like that, um, we're pulling supers off to make sure that we have our honey set aside. 
and the bees have what they need to go. So we always leave enough, obviously, for the bees, because like I said, you do have to be careful that they have enough feed there. Um, and if you take too much, you're going to need to supplement that food. So just making sure that you don't leave the bees hanging is a really, um, a really big key aspect here. So with these longer days, with the flowers dwindling and drying up, you do need to make sure that your bees have plenty of water. You need to make sure that your bees have plenty of, um, plenty of food. And other than that, that that's the simple version of it. Um, as, we, as we get into the later part of the summer and into the fall is where you're really going to start seeing the treatments that people talk about with mite and, and disease control seems to be a little bit more prominent at this time of year. And that's for a couple of reasons. Um, one, mites have a very similar trajectory to bees, but it's a little delayed, meaning their highest numbers are gonna be kind of after the bees start to slow down. As we head into fall and winter, bees start to get into decrease mode, as opposed to the increase that we were talking about there in the springtime. So, with fall, again, we're characterizing that with the weather cooling down, plants and flowers are starting to bloom again, those fall flowers, and your days are getting a little bit shorter. Bees do have some access to, to nectar and pollen, and, and so you're just kind of monitoring them. Now, you will see them bringing in nectar and pollen, and you'll want to watch a little bit for space, but you're probably not going to be seeing quite as much abundance of new wax production, new comb production, um, and having to just stack on boxes and boxes and boxes like you do in the spring. So a little bit more tame version of growth, um, but it's, it's a little blip um, that's a blessing for the bees right before winter. So that is, that is what fall looks like as a beekeeper. So this is when you're going to want to do, like I said, your, your monitoring for mites and your potential requeening or treatments according to whatever, um, you know, pest and disease control system you've subscribed to. We, we follow IPM, meaning we're going to start with the, you know, mechanical treatments um, and then work our way up um, before we use harsh and chemical treatments. And then as I hinted at earlier with that late summer, you are watching, right? Like, especially if you're a new beekeeper, you're watching those resources fairly closely because you'll start to see a rhythm of when to, um, when to freak out if your bees are running out of food and when to just let them do what they need to do. So you will start to, um, to look at reducing the space and, and, and combining hives. And the fall is a little bit better time to do some of that because they've still got some time to get used to it, to recover and move on. So if you need to do any um, equalizing of hives, fall is a great time to do that. Now, winter. Um, winter is characterized for us in more consistently cold days, um, you know, fewer days where the temperatures get up above 55. We are in Texas, so I can think of many Christmas days where we were out, you know, eating uh, Christmas lunch on the patio and it was 90 degrees. So um, just realizing that you may still have a pretty active hive. Um, but you don't need to open it unless the temperatures are a little higher because they should, there should be days like that. So as a beekeeper, you do tend to, um, as a good beekeeper, you do tend to watch the weather a little bit more and make some plans on when a good day to get into the hives is based on the weather that you've been given. So um, as we kind of hint, uh, as we kind of discussed with entrance reducers, the goal here is to give the bees a little less to guard. You're trying to give them, um, you know, a little more buckled down uh, control of their space. So, you know, in the spring, like we mentioned, you're adding these boxes, you're giving them more space 
in the fall and winter, you're starting to kind of shrink that space. Um, and, and the reason we do that is the brood nest is kind of like a football. And in the spring, that football, you know, kind of inflates and you end up, you can have, you know, two full boxes of brood sometimes. Um, in the fall and winter, you'll start to see this brood nest kind of shrink down. And, you know, a lot of times we have plenty of hives that, that never go broodless um, during our Texas winters. But if you, have a, if you have a harsh winter or you have a good cold snap, you may see that your hive actually does go broodless, meaning the queen stops laying um, temporarily and everyone just kind of buckles down, huddles up and, and hangs out. So keeping an eye on, um, keeping an eye on their space and making sure that the bees fit the boxes that they're in. So you don't want to put a five frame nuke into a 10 frame box um, or, you know, um, or have too many boxes left over. You really want to make sure that by the end of fall, start of winter, we kind of use Thanksgiving as a, as a rough um, time frame. that by Thanksgiving, they're basically um, looking good for heading into, um, heading into the next year. Um, so ideally, you wouldn't have to be messing with them in December or January. So, um, so during those months that you have off from your beekeeping duties, you will want to pay. You will want to be planning ahead for your next season, making repairs to your equipment, building equipment, ordering queens if you plan to requeen the next year or plan to do splits the next year, making plans for your own queen production if that's something that you're wanting to do. But basically, have a good idea of what you're going to be doing. You don't want to wait till the last minute and end up having to order things um, that are then you know, backlogged and, and don't get to you in time. So winter is a really good time to kind of plan ahead and figure out what you're going to do for the next year. So as, as we dig into these hives, there's a couple of things that we're consistently looking for. Um, we're consistently looking for um, productive queens, we're consistently looking for resources, um, and, and we're consistently looking for hives that are built out with a good structure. Um, is the comb straight? This is especially important in our top bar hives. Um, and then pests and diseases and space. So we've talked a little bit about both of, or really all of these things as we've gone through the seasonality of beekeeping. But I am going to dig in and show you some actual examples so that you can understand what this means in practice when you see these things. So while you're looking for eggs and larvae and healthy brood, while you're looking for pollen and nectar and capped and uncapped honey, while you're looking for um, freshly drawn comb or the lack of freshly drawn comb, um, looking for you know, smells of, of diseases or signs of diseases like deformed wings or lots and lots of hive beetles everywhere, or larvae or wax spots inside your hive. Um, and while you're looking for space, so figuring out, you know, do I need to add some more space? Do I need to be kind of crunching them down? All of that is both seasonal, but it also is going to depend on what you're actually seeing inside your hive. And so we're gonna balance that seasonality with some actual examples. So here's the first one. Um, queen cells are pretty common. We see stuff like this. If you have multiple hives, um, you, will see, you will see them. Um, we've got the capped queen cells over here where you can kind of um, where you can kind of see the fingers kind of sticking out of the, the comb. We have the cells with the royal jelly and the larva inside them. Those are actually two different ages of larva, which is kind of neat to see. Um, and then we've also got this cell over here that is, uh, looks like the start of a queen cell. So 
Um, you've got multiple different types of queen cells that you may see. A supersedure cell means they saw something in that queen that they did not like, they wanna get rid of her. They're going to go ahead, make a new queen so that they can um, you know, push her out the door. Um, the swarm cells are gonna be more, uh, more a sign of a really healthy hive. So if your hive's doing really great, you end up with a whole bunch of swarm cells, it's because they've made it to the point where they're ready to go and reproduce at a colony level instead of just at the simple reproduction level here. And emergency cells are when something's happened to the queen. Maybe she was injured. Maybe, um, maybe she's, um, you know, well, most likely injured. Maybe you smushed her. Um, in those situations, they're going to go ahead and build some, some cells with whatever they've already got laying around. So that can be a reason why you'll see larvae at different ages. Um, and then, um, cause they're, they're grabbing what they're grabbing, what they, they could and turning those existing eggs and larvae into queens. And then practice cells, which is likely this thing here in the corner is basically just them making sure they know what they're doing. And so sometimes you'll see them starting to build these queen cells and they're just there. Um, they don't plan on doing anything with them. So when you pick up that frame, um, you know, you're gonna make sure that you look down in it and see if you see royal jelly. Um, royal jelly is essentially easier to see a lot of times even than eggs and larvae. So in a queen cell, it's gonna be pretty present. Um, there's gonna be a, um, a good abundance of it in most cases, as long as, as, long as it's a well-fed hive. And so that's sometimes, I think, an easier way to look at it. Now, you see these things, what is it that you should do? Um, so there's a lot of different possibilities here. And, and I'm gonna kind of break that down. So if you, if you see swarm cells, you know, I've, I've seen eight, 10, 15 more um, cells inside a, inside a hive before, you can take those cells and repurpose them. You can make them um, into new splits. If you have them on the, um, on the plasticell, uh, the right cell foundation rather than a wax foundation. There's some people that say you can't remove those. We have been able to remove them um, successfully. So just making sure that they're nice and sturdy, they're, they're ready to be moved and really cutting deep in and behind with a, with a really fine razor blade. Um, we use like this, the longer, um, thinner razor blades, that can, that can work. Um, if you're using foundation lists, it's even easier. You just cut that out and you can um, take it over into another hive. If you're moving a queen cell, you wanna be super careful. They are, um, they are pretty, I mean, they're, they're pretty fragile. And so you just wanna make sure that when you take it, you're keeping it in that same vertical position when you put it into the new hive. So anyway, you can make some splits. If, if you feel like there's something not right, like maybe they shouldn't be building queen cells. A good example of this is, um, I see this with brand new packages a lot. People will bring a package home. You know, when you get a package, there's no comb, it's just bees, some sugar syrup, some, some syrup and a queen. You go, you put that in the, in your box and the bees are expected to build everything from the comb out, right? And so what ends up happening is bees communicate with pheromones, eggs have a pheromone, brood has a pheromone, and all of that allows each of the bees to see how the hive is doing. Now, if you take some mature you know, these are younger bees, but you take them and you stick them into a new hive and they, they came from a hive that was producing. Now all of a sudden they're in this place, right? Where there's no eggs, there's no brood, there's no larva to take care of. 
they may start to freak out and think the moment they see some eggs, oh, we better get a queen in here because this one's not doing her job. Well, the reality is she just hasn't been there long enough to build up that, that scent that the hive needs to feel like everything is going okay. And so if it's that first little bit, you just installed a package, I would probably just tear down that cell because most likely the bees are just a little bit um, you know, shook up, confused based on what we just put them through. Um, so that's an example of, of tearing down the cell. If you need to buy yourself a little bit of time, you wanna tear down those cells um, so that you can bring in a queen that you actually want to utilize that works as well. Introducing a new queen is an option. Um, if you, if you want to take your old queen, once these cells start to be built, sometimes people find it to be a little bit easier to take the old queen and put her into a new box. Um, and maybe easier isn't the right option, but, uh, or right word, but by doing that, the theory is that you're kind of Me mechanizing a swarm, right? Like, so you created a swarm by taking that old queen, a couple of frames and some brood and some bees, putting them into a new box, you essentially just created a swarm for those bees. And so by doing that, you can, you can kind of um, suppress, hopefully, her desire to swarm and she'll feel like she did, she did her thing, and she's ready to kind of start her next box, next hive. Um, and so that's what a lot of times when we introduce a new queen, as long as we liked that older queen, we'll go ahead and shift her over. Um, if this is happening and your queen is not super productive, you may not want her progeny to be the queen, right? Like if you don't want the genetics that she has, you may want to go ahead and source yourself a queen that you actually want to use. And, and so this would be an opportunity for you to go ahead and, and do that. Now, the other thing you could do is, is nothing, um, especially in the case of these practice cells, there's nothing you really need to do. Um, if you feel like, uh, you know, if you live out in the middle of nowhere and your bees are going to swarm and you don't feel like messing with it at that moment, cool. Like they're your bees. Um, just know that if you're in the middle of a city and your bees swarm, they might move into someone's house. So you don't want to make enemies either. Um, so doing, doing some swarm prevention is certainly smart. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, um, this is, this is what bees do. So um, doing nothing and, and watching what happens is an option. Um, may not be your best option, but it is an option. So the next scenario when we're looking inside a hive is we're always looking for brood pattern um, issues. We're looking for successful brood pattern, brood pattern that looks great, right? This example over here with this super golden velvety um, um, brood where just a few little um, cells have been you know, either skipped or maybe there was, you know, some sick brood that the bees took out. Um, but it even looks like they've got some larvae in these developing. So even the ones that were empty, the queen came back and filled up that space. That's, that's awesome. That's what you want to see. That's a queen that's laying well and is, is getting to work. Um, so that, that would be a, that would be a, a solid brood pattern. Shotgun brood pattern is going to look a little bit more like this one down here in the corner where it's pretty sporadic. Um, there's a little bit of things, there, there's a lot going on in this particular picture. So I included it just to, to give us some talking points. Um, but in this picture down here um, with, with the more shotgun style bees, there's some perforated and sunken um, tappings. There's, you know, some larva intermixed in there. And there's actually quite a bit of shiny liquid inside some of these. So it's a combination of, of, of things that are worrisome and maybe some things that are pretty normal. And what I mean by that is um, during during abundance of food, during an abundance of nectar, 
Bees will take that nectar and they will put it anywhere they can inside the hive and then they'll come back and they'll redistribute that stuff. So if you're sitting there feeding them nectar and they're going out and getting nectar, it's not uncommon to come back and the brood nest be actually back filled with liquid with nectar um, because they just don't have anywhere else to store it and they don't have enough wax built out to fill up more cells. And so you do have to be careful and watch that. The, the other thing that I see here with the, with the perforated cappings that I was talking about could be a sign um, of disease. So that's something I'm gonna watch over time and see if it changes, see if it's something that, um, that the bees seem to be taking care of and managing on their own, or if it's something that the hive might benefit from a new queen or some sort of mite treatment, depending on kind of how they're acting over the course of the next few weeks. So most of our judgment is made in the course of a few weeks, but remembering that anything that we do today, you're not gonna see the effects of that for 30 or even 60 days from that day. And so, you know, things with bees do take time, meaning we need to give them that time before we start messing with things too terribly much because you can overmanage and overwork your bees. So I know this is a lot. <laughs> um, and, and so we'll just keep on talking. This one here in the middle is pretty interesting because what's happening here um, is the, the queen likely started in the middle laying, she started kind of going out and laying outside. And so what's happened is the middle, the middle brood has actually emerged out of their cells and the outer brood is still left in their capped pupil stage ready to emerge. And so that's, that's a very solid pattern. It's a little tricky because it looks like maybe it's not a solid pattern, but it actually is, is very good. So um, this, this goes to show you that you don't want to make any judgments um, on one single frame. You want to look at the entire hive and see kind of how she's doing. If you have a frame or two of this super solid brood pattern, and then you've got, you know, a frame that you're like, ah, I can't tell what she's doing over here. I don't think I would be freaking out about that. Um, she's obviously capable of laying really well. And so you may just be getting, you know, where they've, where they've kind of backfilled, put some resources in and she's laid where she could and then she kind of moved on. So keeping an eye and making a judgment on the whole hive over time is what we really want to be doing here. So what do you do? If you have a hive that is looking great, you do nothing. <laughs> Like you let her do her thing. You go, you go on like, I mean, you celebrate that. That's an awesome situation to be. If the brood pattern is really shoddy, you want to make sure that you are ready to make a change. So what I mean by that is if it's the end of the year, if it's, you know, winter time and you get in and you see stuff like this, that's not when you're going to make any changes. You need to make sure there's commercially available queens um, so realistically, you're going to be wanting to, um, well, and let me rephrase, you don't have to buy commercially available queens, but it's a good indicator of whether or not it's time to actually replace a queen, because if commercially available queens are available, then your hive would, in theory, still be able to mate and make um, and, and successfully mate. If, commercially queen, if commercial queens are not available in your area, it may be because the drone population is really low and so they haven't been mating successfully and so they're not being sold. Um, so, so when I say that, it's, it's more of an indicator of the season than it is the fact that you need to buy a commercially available queen. So when I talk about, when I talk about um, going ahead and requeening, we're, we're essentially making the decision that, you know, this hive is not doing that great. We've caught it early enough. We're going to go ahead and requeen. And in 30, 60 days, we'll have a better hive on our hands that we can do something with. 
if we feel like it's gone too far and you know the population is dwindled and we will get into that here in just a second there there's some different options that that you may consider at that point so in the cases of low population if if you open your hive and it looks like this you may want to um you may want to you may want to be shaking those bees out and starting over to be honest but um it can be and we'll get to that um it can be a sign of pests and diseases it can be a, a sign of of the hive going queenless um, maybe they swarmed and the the next queen did not successfully mate and take off like like she should have um, if the hive is queenless workers um, workers do have ovaries they are capable of laying eggs they just don't have fully fully functioning reproductive systems. And so they've never mated and all of their eggs are considered infertile, which in a lot of organisms would mean, you know, you don't get a baby at all. <laughs> in, the, in the bee world, what that means is you get a lot of males. So males are, um, males come from infertile eggs. And so um, if you look at this, if this middle, picture here, that's a situation where either the queen came back and did not successfully mate, and so she's only laying infertile eggs, um, or um, laying workers, which means that the queen um, either is not there at all or has such low mandibular pheromone um, and, um, and brood production that the workers started to lay eggs uh, as well, and you end up with this with this um, drone um, with a whole bunch of drone cells. So you can you can see those drone cells because they're nice and puffy, like kicks cereal, as opposed to these more flat ones up here where you have bees that have just not simply not emerged yet. So if you have population dwindling. Your, your options kind of depend on how early you check or how early you, um, you're able to react. So um, if, if you can, you can go ahead and combine those, um, combine those hives. You can also go ahead and um, try to find the queen and requeen if it's, if it's early enough. Um, and then you know, the other thing you could do is try to take, take some, if it's queenless and you've figured this out, you could take some uncapped, very young eggs and larvae from another hive, put it in, uh, maybe even give them some capped larvae so that they're capped brood so that those bees can emerge and help take care of those hives um, just to boost that population and give them a leg up. So you can, once you have lots of hives, the cool thing is you can kind of borrow and share from each of these hives so that you have a little bit better situation going in. So there you go. Now, if you open up your hives and you see stuff like this, this is a little, a little too late um, as far as saving the wax in this hive uh, with these wax moths with this webbing. And then you've also got these down here with the, with the larva. Um, which is the small high beetle larva that's kind of sliming this resource frame. And then you have just a small high beetle chilling on a frame over here. And, um, and of these, the webbing and the larva crawling around are the two that actually would, would be alarming. And this little guy over here on the corner, you know, maybe I Maybe I smush him, but I, I'm not going. I'm not going crazy if I see something like that. Um, the reason, the reason why um, you're going to have some level of pests inside your hive, um, not so much wax moths really, um, but but you will see small hive beetles, and you will see um, you will see uh, that the bees will kind of keep them off to the sides. And in, in those cases, um, you, can, you can pretty much 
um, you can pretty much ignore it. Uh, it's, it's when it becomes this larval, this larval sliming situation that, that you really need to, um, to do something. So if you're worried about it and you feel like there's kind of an abundance of small hive beetles before it gets to the slime, you can put in shims, you can put um, Swiffer dry, dryer sheets um, into, the, um, into the top and the bees will kind of uh, ruffle it up the small hive beetles will get chased into them and stuck to them. And then, um, and then you can kind of monitor your hive beetle population in that way. Keeping your hives in sunnier areas is gonna help with this in general because bees and wax moths don't really like really sunny areas. And so, um, so that, that will help as well. Now, if you've gotten to the point where there are wax moths and slimy, hive beetle larva infestations. We take our frames, we stick them in the freezer for 48 hours, um, put them in there for a few days, pull them out. Um, you can actually slowly give them back to the bees and, um, and the bees will actually clean them up. So even this wax moth uh, situation over here, when they look at that, when the bees get in there, they'll actually take that all of that webbing and they will just pull it out of the hive. Now you don't want to stick five or six frames of this into a hive and just make their day miserable, but you can, like I said, distribute them out or give them to them slowly because the bees will clean it up pretty nicely and they'll be able to salvage more of the wax than, um, than if you were to just scrape the whole thing down. And, and wax is extremely valuable. It's a cumbersome thing for bees to make. They've got to consume a lot of honey and nectar to do that. And so, you know, letting them utilize what they've made is, is really great. And so giving that back to them is, is a good idea. And it's, and, and it's fine. Um, this is a pretty natural occurrence. So I wouldn't freak out about that. So here is the super oversimplified version of what we just talked about. Um, essentially, when your population is off, you can split or merge that hive, um, combine it with something else. Obviously, you know, requeening and stuff like that, there, you can do a lot of these um, interchangeably and, and they all affect one another. Uh, so, you know, focusing on these five areas and, and trying to make sure your population is right, your resources are right, you know, your pests and diseases are controlled, the space, um, the space for that population is right, and that your queen is productive. If you focus on those areas, you're golden, right? Your bees, you have done everything you can for your bees. Um, and so at that point, you know, um, you, if you lose a hive at that point, you can feel like you really truly did everything that you could and that those bees just weren't meant to be in your apiary. Uh, but but basically, don't overcomplicate it. Focus on these areas, watch for things that don't seem quite right, and you should be pretty good to go. So if you have questions, you guys can reach out to me. All of my contact information is right here. My husband and I own, like I said, um, Prime Bees and Bryan College Station. And so we are available to answer some questions whenever you need it. Um, there's our email address and you can always reach out to us on social media or our website as well. So thanks so much. And I hope you learned something today.